Welcome to this special edition of the Fremantle Press podcast. Today we are recording in Walialup in Wajat Nungabuja, and I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This is a place of Bula Barip, which means many stories. And I'd also like to acknowledge our First Nations peoples as the first storytellers right across Australia. My name is Helen Milroy and I absolutely love kids' books. I'm also an author and an illustrator and I love hosting this podcast because we get to talk to fabulous and interesting people about their books. So today we're joined by Ashka, co-creator of the book Stars in Their Eyes with Jessica Walton. Ashka is an energetic visual storyteller, illustrator and science communicator who is a passionate advocate for visual literacy. She has illustrated 10 published books and is a regular contributor to the school magazine and other children's publications. She is also part of many creative organisations and for four years was the illustrator co-coordinator for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, Australia West. She's also a recipient of several government arts, grants, prizes and the Magids Fellowship. Ashka, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty amazing bio, and I know we've got a little bit more about that coming up later on in the show, so I'm really, really happy to be speaking to you today. You call yourself a visual storyteller. I'm just wondering whether you'd like to explore with our listeners today what that really means for you. Yeah, um, so I guess uh, very early on through various manifestations of, of my careers and lives, I realised that I was really interested in uh, explaining things through visuals. And when I finally kind of landed in the publishing sector, I got a lot of projects and that included things like doing middle grade books or working on picture books, or then doing comics and graphic novels. And I've realized that all of those contributions are very different. I am required uh, not just to do what I would classically think an illustrator's job is, but also do things like design, layout, problem solve for the publisher. I've had publishers approach me with the manuscript and weren't even sure if it could be uh, visualized. So, but being a person was bringing forth um, kind of like a, you know, an expertise by having a dimension in my brain that's very visual. I can help out with uh, reframing and re- kind of repackaging certain ideas visually. So I think that illustration is part of that, but also there's so many other jobs involved with that. Um, and I also just want to say that I'm not alone in thinking that illustrator is a bit of a strange, outdated term. It has a lot of baggage with it, kind of like the word comics as well. Illustration actually comes from the times where to illustrate was to depict what is seen. So it was kind of like copying reality. And before we had photography in advertising, illustrators would just draw and paint realistic versions of basically something that wanted to be displayed and sold. But of course, now the illustrating uh, industry and, and community is so rich. It's all about independent creation. It's about um, like basically intelligence, like intelligently showing things, making visual metaphors, you're taking people on a journey. And, and I feel like the term is so insufficient to describe the amount of agency that people have. So I suppose this is why I like to call myself a visual storyteller, because then it makes people pause and kind of maybe reassess what is it that I'm doing, rather than just take for granted that I'm drawing pictures that describe what someone's written. Yeah, that's a much, much broader description and a multiplicity of roles, as you described. So I guess part of that role came really to the fore as the co-creator of Stars in Their Eyes. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. I guess um, it was Fremantle Press who has had the idea of seeing the short story and thinking what a great thing it would be to turn it into a young people's graphic novel. Uh, When Jess adapted their short story into a a screenplay, essentially, which was a a long conversation between characters, Uh, it fleshed out their identity and their characteristics. It was really a a fantastic resource to be able to imagine and understand what they're like, as well as obviously the storyline. It was then handed over to me with the hope that I could yeah, make the graphic novel out of that text. So essentially, uh, what that involved was <laughs> was quite a few steps. But here, I would like to maybe just compare it to doing a picture book. So I think with a picture book, there are definitely two definite roles, if you are collaborating, of course. So you would have the, the text of the picture book, which is written in a particular way. There's a rhythm, and you straight away know where the text will fall on each spread. It's pretty much split up into spreads. And so the writer actually envisages the turning of the pages and they know where the text will be. And then the illustrator or the artist comes along and uh, 
basically responds to the text on each spread. And you know, that can be done in so many different ways. And it can be, you know, very imaginative and, and um, almost like contradictory. They can develop a whole alternative story, but they are working with the guidance of the words on each page. So this is why I think there's two jobs there, because the screenplay doesn't have a vision for how it's going to be a graphic novel. It has a vision for the characters and the story. But then the middle job is to design the structure. It's kind of, I call it engineering, basically. It's envisaging how the text will be pared down, flow from bubble to bubble in a very intuitive way, so no one is ever ejected. How it flows from panel to panel, how the panels move over page turns and then of course what roughly would be in each panel the idea of how you slow down and speed up the visually that story whether you're going to depict the character speaking or whether you're going to depict what they're talking about of course the angles whether you're showing their faces or their hands all of this stuff is engineering because it directs how you want the reader to feel with the given text in the medium of graphic novels. That is before you start drawing. This is not the, what I would call, you know, the illustration or the art rendering, because you could then give this structure to the third person who then would go and make the artwork. Or you could get someone who, you know, does, isn't even like the most amazing artist to do this. And it would still be a good comic if the engineering was done right. Because for me, comics are like an experience. You know, you enter this vehicle and then you ride. But rather than a movie that kind of does it all for you, you put the elements together in your head to make the experience happen. And, you know, that's kind of why they're so addictive, because you get to participate in the making. But that is not accidental, right? The structure and the engineering is, you know, what I really think is what, what makes the, the, the medium of that graphic novel. And that's the delivery, the package, I guess, of the story. That sounds like quite a sort of unique skill set from what you're actually saying in terms of not just sort of visualisation, it's really a a lot of planning and organisational stuff that goes into how this is going to look and feel and be seen and experienced. You know, definitely being able to see things as a movie helps. So people you talk to will often say, yes, I just see a movie scene. And then you kind of imagine how you want to guide the viewer because of the kind of tropes we already used to seeing movies and how the camera angle works, where the close-ups are. And you know that by putting those panels, which is what we call uh, screenshots in, in comics, when you put those panels together in the reader's mind, yeah, they will very much see a movie. You know, it will be moving for them. But then, of course, apart from that, you then have um, a whole kind of idea of design and layout, understanding how spatially to place things on a page, understanding that, you know, every spread is two pages, but then you want to turn it. How can you interact with that um, geography to uh, have your story flow? You know, if you put a lot of panels close together, you create movement and action, and there's a lot of stuff, and people just don't, don't spend long time looking at each box, but they are going to get an idea of that the story is moving quickly. However, sometimes you might want to make the reader stay and feel. And this is where it's good to remove words and have some sort of really detailed, well-rendered scene so people really get the textures and the other senses involved. So, yeah, it, it is, you know, basically manipulating the reader's emotions, which is what we can do with writing and, and pure illustration as well. But it is done in a continuous way through moving from panel to panel. So there is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of decisions to be made Visual language is not hard and fast. It is flexible. And so you always have to test what you've done. You give it to other people. And if they don't get it, if you have to explain it to them, then you have missed something and you have to rework that part of it. Comics have to be road tested. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's a language that needs to work on your reader. Quite a universal language, actually, isn't it? given that those visual images can be read by anybody. It, yeah, it's very interesting. It's definitely culture uh, dependent. But today, yeah, the culture is international. But sorry, to kind of come back in a really big arc to your original <laughs> question, <laughs> what happened in our particular case is when I got just uh, just a screenplay, I, I got to work on it for about three months, kind of thinking about how I'm going to build that structure. And then I was able to talk to Jess And that was really important, of course, because even though I identify with Maisie quite a lot, the main character in Stars and Rise, mainly because I was always the weird kid, but I'm also very stubborn, so I would refuse to kind of change. So I had this, like, dichotomy of uh, being out there going, yeah, that's the way I am, but also feeling anxious about that. And I think Maisie has a similar feeling, obviously, for different reasons, like she can't change the fact that she's an amputee. But I totally understand the feelings that 
Maisie has these conflicting kind of sides to her. Um, and I really like that about her. But talking to Jess was just even this other dimension about what it's like to have an amputation. I mean, I spent a lot of time watching videos and doing research if you always spoke, but it was really, really interesting and instrumental in understanding the character. And then Jess was so kind to send me uh, a bunch of videos. I need to understand how Maisie would move with a prosthetic leg or with crutches and how she would get off the floor and, you know, simple things like out of the car. You know, this is vulnerable to ask Jess those things, but they were really awesome in sending me those videos and they were so useful in me analyzing that movement and being able to put that in the story. And I guess also reflecting Jess themselves in that character. Sounds like a lot of trust had to be developed for that process to work well. Yeah, I, I thought that that was, uh, that was really great and I appreciated that a lot. And for me, you know, that experience is also so special. Every, every time I work on a project with someone, you have this quite a personal connection to their artistic and creative and also life story. And that's a privilege for me to, to be able to be part of that. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, I suppose making comics is a very solitary task. So uh, after having that information, then, I, you know, I, I went off for another, I don't know, eight months and worked on the final line work where you do more refining of your structure and engineering, you know, part. But then you actually draw the characters and you think about all the crazy stuff that goes with that, which is basically... What do they look like? How do they move? What clothes do they wear? How are we going to show, you know, their nervous tics and their uh, little idiosyncrasies? It sounds like there was a lot of um, emphasis on making that very realistic by actually having that real life experience with Jessica as part of that process and the videos and the images and things like that, that you were able to draw from. And of course, I knew that this story is so important to all the people who've never seen themselves represented in that way. So they are the, the ones who have to connect to it. So if I was just pretending that I knew what was being talked about, it would become very clear quickly. Like my earlier work, my story with Paul Russell, which was about dyslexia, um, you know, that was very interesting thinking about like working with the children and having idea of what, what actually worked and didn't. So yeah, I take that very seriously. I mean, if you are going to be a, a visual storyteller, then you are telling the story. And, and some people will just look at that part of it. So they need to get the same feeling and information from you as they get from the other side, the other party. So Ashka, you've had some really amazing success with this book, uh, which is a children's book, Council of Australia, notable book, and recently made it into the shortlist for the Alia Graphic Novel Award. I think what's most exciting for Fremantle Press is, is the fact that the book is also going to America to be published there in 2023. Did you have to make any adjustments for a different audience, um, different country? Yeah, th there were definitely adjustments to be made. I, I initially really worried that it would be quite a lot of adjustments. Um, there was talk of changing the ending, and that, of course, is a huge amount of work from my side uh, on a project that in my mind has been has some sort of closure to it you know so it's kind of hard to return to something after a few months of uh, moving on to other things but no actually in the end um, the changes were quite interesting they have very thorough uh, sensitivity reading uh, policies and a lot of multi multi editing checks like even little things like how many hairpins does Maisie have on the left and the right hand side of her head you know it's easy things for us here to overlook as, as much as we may try to to uh, keep that in mind so those little things all came back and I had to fix them. And, you know, there was a lot of little changes. Luckily, I didn't have to change the, the orientation of the um, steering wheel on the car because there was some driving involved in the book. And, of course, it's Australian based. So I was really happy about that. And also, we had to add some extra pages to the book, which was fun because I love designing books. You know, a lot of the books I illustrate and work on, I also design. So I'll be the last person to kind of touch the files before they get sent to the printer. So that means I choose the font and then I lay out the imprint pages and the pages before and after. And that's a really cool, fun thing to do and be part of. And with the American version, there was just like more things we could play with. And a worthy exercise as well, given the extra audience that you get to deliver your book to. So well done. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I think we're both looking forward to that. <laughs> Ashka, I'm interested to know how you got into this whole field in the first place. It sounds to me like you've had a bit of a journey. And I also am aware that you hold a degree um, both in arts and in physics which is, a, you know, an interesting backstory. So, so tell us how all of this came about. 
I guess, yeah, my first profession, my first calling was physics. And in many ways, it was because I was encouraged when I was young to follow some sort of artistic direction. But being me, I said, how dare you tell me what to do? I am going to do mathematics and, and physics, which to me is very visual. You know, when I think of maths, it's a language of graphs and visualizing movements, tendencies, patterns. So I did wonder, Ashka, whether the sort of physics side of things helped you with your engineering. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. The organization of thought is useful. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, physics was definitely a, a great thing. I enjoyed a lot the freedom it gave me to travel, to meet a lot of new people. It kind of taught me not to fear the unknown, but rather just a, approach it with a set of skills. So it doesn't really matter what field uh, I have a problem in. I know that rather than panicking, which you know would be a natural first reaction, <laughs> is to just go, you know, I'm going to try to sort this out, physically write it down and then workshop what are some of the things I could do. And that's actually a really, really cool tool to be given for life uh, and creativity as well. And actually, while I was doing it, because I was working on uh, quantum teleportation and quantum optics, a lot of people in my near circle, my family, didn't really want to get engaged in my explanations. So I thought, this is not good enough. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start making comics and little cartoons that try to explain some of the concepts and maybe make them much more easy to understand. And I was very, I was scolded for that in my department. People were worrying that my thesis wouldn't be taken seriously if I had cartoons in it and that it was belittling somehow the importance of the work. But, you know, I really didn't think that that was uh, an issue. And I know that later, after I graduated, I had some requests from other PhD students to make similar work for their thesis and because it is such a great way to communicate. Oh, absolutely. You found a way to translate incredibly complex concepts into something that people could actually understand. I think it's amazing. Yeah, and engage with, I guess, emotionally. You know, a lot of people turn off the emotion when you start talking physics, maths, they go, ah, the only emotion is panic. But then what happened was I realized that physics is what I call a jealous mistress. And uh, you can have no others. Uh, and I am, you know, I'm full of uh, energy and interest. And I want to do lots of things, whether it's creativity and performance, travel, and even outreach. So I just decided that I was going to change what I was doing and, and pursued the visual part of my interest. A lot of people find that transition really difficult and they sort of have to kind of almost build up a level of courage to to take that leap of faith almost. How was that for you? Yeah, it was definitely challenging. You know, this is very early on in my life. I'm in my um, <clears throat> probably mid-20s. And at that point, I've been climbing, you know, I've been climbing this ladder of, I don't know if I call it success, but, you know, some sort of achievement because it works on scholarship basis. So to get sm to, into a smaller and smaller uh, specialization, you are getting closer and closer to certain groups that do that research in the world and they fund you to go places, these summer schools and being hosted in different universities, being paid, you know, to play with lasers. So it was important. And then suddenly to say, you know what, I'm leaving it all behind. It was stressful. It was stressful for not only me, but also the department, for example, that would have me because then the money that was given to them, what would happen to it? So, you know, it was for someone who was so young, I, I guess, and lacking certain perspective and, and maybe even in some way, you know, value of the, how important my mental health and my uh, commitment to myself is. But I'm really glad I did it, you know, and I will say to anyone young who's listening today, it's actually really great to change your mind. Like, don't worry if you start doing something and after a year or two, uh, you decide that it's not for you. Because what you'll actually end up with is an amazing set of extra skills. Those skills are always going to be useful. You know, it's, it's like versus having one straight uh, career path all your life to getting three, you suddenly have a very niche market. What do you think helped you along the way in that transition with a particular things or people that, that, that helped you to sort of kind of cement that progress forward? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, my, my parents were a great help. I, I did. I know they were always very proud of me and my achievements, but uh, they were also very supportive, which was great. I also remember right at the end when I was having a really difficult time, by this stage I was in Denmark, in Copenhagen, uh, working for Niels Bohr Institute. And I started going to the libraries there and just to relax, to read their amazing graphic novel collections. Because at that point, Australian graphic novel collections uh, went that expensive. And I found these books by a guy called Dave McKean. Some of you might know him because he used to do a lot of stuff with Neil Gaiman. He's a fine artist and he was doing very early digital collages as well as painting and ink work. I mean, his comics were about everyday experiences, about a smell of coffee, about sound of music, about emotional uh, turmoil. 
And I thought, this is what I want to do. I remember having this moment thinking, I don't know what's going to happen next, but I want to be going in that direction. The beauty and the poetry of what he was able to achieve visually with minimum amount of words, that really clicked. Looking back, I think that was a, a really nice to have that marker there, like that's what I'm heading towards. Did you do a lot of reading as a kid? Did you have a favourite book of, of any description? And, and perhaps what did that mean to you growing up? Uh, I'm an only child and I was left to my own devices a lot to basically amuse myself. So I would read. But when I was really little, I lived in Poland. So I don't really have any contact with that part of my life anymore. I don't, wouldn't be able to tell you what most of the books were. However, there was this one series of comics written by a guy called Tadeusz Baranowski. Um, they're really kind of late 80s uh, adventure stories of little characters done in a very psychedelic style. But the most amazing thing about those comics is that the characters are aware that they're in the book and they'll interact with the panels and they'll interact with the pages, they'll rip through them to the other side, they'll fold things up. They will even interact with the maker and the maker's hand that will sometimes appear, you know, in these comics. And to me as a child, I will never forget what impact that had because that made me understand that everything was very malleable. Like there was no straight divisions between reality and fiction and words and images and, you know, feelings and, and real concrete things. I really started to think that, um, yeah, there was no rules. That anything is possible. Yes, exactly. I really thought that broke the walls. And, you know, especially that I was kind of living in quite grey and sad times outside. So having these books that were super colourful and really out there um, basically formed my imagination, for, forged it in, in some sort of, you know, open and unbound mm. way. So where do you get your inspiration from now? Uh, other people's work is always really inspiring. Um, as much as I'm not a huge fan of social media, I do really enjoy going through Instagram and looking at how other people are working, what they're doing. Um, sometimes that little thing will spark off something two weeks later and off I go with an idea. Uh, even listening to music and seeing people perform music or going and see fine art exhibitions, um, anything that where people are creating, storytelling, uh, yeah. In fact, ideas are really never a problem. It's more time, finding time to <laughs> realise them. How long does it take from that sort of that process to kind of really get embedded and then to actually get to the end point? For some people, it seems it could be 10, 20 years. For others, it's, you know, a matter of weeks. What, what, what's that process like for you? I think that it depends on how deep you're digging with the idea. So a lot of the time when I have a deadline with a publisher, I need to get inspired quickly so so you will then surround yourself with these ideas and work on it night and day and then it is really frustrating for a long time you're pushing a rock up a very steep hill and nothing's happening sometimes for a week or two and you just you get a little bit anxious but eventually by pure work and putting the hours in you actually start to see things coalesce and that is a great moment so that's the way that, that would be a relatively you know short time because i have no choice but if i'm working on like a love project Oh, it could be years. I mean, there's something I'm working on now that has been brewing for about seven years. And there are years where I haven't touched it, but it's it's been growing into just new dimensions because of my life experience and my more informed view of what it is that I'm working on. So Sounds like um, a journey. Yeah, you know, and that's beautiful. But that's, of course, because it's a private project, it's just like almost like a baby that you're... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's very precious and you don't want to let it go yet. <laughs> So with, with that um, and how you've described that, have you have there been periods of time when you felt quite frustrated in the process and, and how do you overcome those kind of periods where it, it might feel like it's all not going as well as you'd liked? Yeah, look, every project, uh, as I said, has the same um, graph if you graphed it and the beginning is always pushing the rock up the hill. It, it, the, the period of that depends on, on a lot of things but I just know it's going to be there like I just accept that the beginning is not going to be easy that I'm gonna um, have to sleep on it quite a few times I often lay my work up on a floor and then I'll come back to it um, because I work digitally um, I always make sure I print everything at actual size especially even with the initial sketches and stuff uh, playing with design or you know where the words or images will be that's really important I guess there's something in our brain you know that's just it's about physicality the screen can misleading um, and I guess their books end up being physical anyway uh, but yeah so that's always uh, frustrating but I think for me another thing is change I always have a few things on the go and 
um, it's easy then if I change, suddenly it, it is really, I believe that change is as good as a holiday. It really does shift your brain in a different gear and you're doing something. I'm not just sitting there pulling my hair <laughs> uh, and also getting out. You know, like I find that on one side, my personality is that I would love to sit in my house and just work, work, work forever. But what actually ends up happening is that after a week or two of doing that, I start throwing shoes at the screen <laughs> because I get so frustrated with myself. That's there, funny. There is, it's so important, right, to go out and talk to people, to go and do, whether it's performances or workshops, to whether see friends and catch up and tell them about what's annoying you, uh, to go outside and, I don't know, see a park or see an exhibition. I've learned <laughs> the hard way that this is the way, even though it seems like a time waste at the time when you're really stressed, it's really important um, to move through those difficult periods. I was yeah. going to say to you that, well, I was going to ask you about how you do look after yourself because this is a tricky industry and it has its ups and downs. Um, is, is that part of the process for you to stay healthy is trying to get that balance? You know, clearly you do want to be in there doing the work and, and just really escape into that creative space. But there's a reality that you need for yourself as a as a person, as a human, in a way, that sort of interaction with others and being out and about and being part of the world. Exactly. I'm pretty good at routines. So I have a routine where I'll go cycling every morning Um yeah, I'll just get on a bike before I even can make a decision that it's a bad idea and, and go. And it's always a great uh, to come back and, and feel, you know, refreshed. And I will be sitting for most of the day after yeah. that. So that. And uh, um, I think a healthy mind probably means less throwing shoes at the ca- at these screens. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and screens are expensive. Ashka, what do you want children in particular to get out of your books? Um, I think my main objective is for them to make their own stories that, to, do, to have the freedom to do that, to be able to have just enough elements to then start putting them together, make their own voices, weave maybe uh, alternative endings or sequels in their minds, and then feel brave enough to go and, and maybe start drawing their own little books. Um, uh, yeah, I just want them to feel that the characters have a life beyond that page and that other things could happen to them and that the kids are actually the masters of that. What do you think you want the parents to get out of it? the fun of the kids just winging it, like seeing your child add to the story or maybe try to read it or tell you what's happening in the story according to their version. There's something so cool about not having to correct and say, well, this is not the way it's done. Uh, Unknowingly, we do try to tell children, oh, this is not how you use this thing. You do it like that. And then we kind of close the door almost, right? When you think about it, the beauty of being a kid is that you want to turn things upside down and shake them and press the button or maybe invent something completely new. And so I I hope that, uh, yeah, it just gives parents that moment of joy to see their kids kind of doing that with their impromptu storytelling and libbing or whatever it may be. That's, I kind of would love that joy, you know. It's a wonderful part of, I think, being a parent is having that creative process with your child and just creating something new and imaginative and magical together. You can't really recreate that in any other way. It's just It just happens in the moment, and I think that's a wonderful way to connect with uh, uh, parents and children. Ashka, any final words for us today? Well, I would say that um, I really do hope that we are going to start taking images as seriously as we do words, especially in um, in schools and education. I think that um, when you think about language, it's just a subsection of drawing anyway, like letters are just symbols and they create all this language and you can create just as rich of a language with line work on white paper. So I, I would, um, yeah, I would just warn that not doing that, it means that we're resulting in a society of people who have visually illiterate, but yet all of our communication is multimodal. You know, you think about your social media accounts and all the advertising and propaganda and the ideas and news we get is is a combination of uh, little sound bites and visuals. And we have to be able to critically assess that and we can only really do that if we taught that. So uh, I would say, you know, let's enjoy books, let's have fun and let's read more comics and picture books. But I think it's important to also study them at school. And, and t- because it is a serious thing and it will help us all. So, yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. I think um, much more visual literacy would be a very, very, very good thing. So absolutely 100% behind you there on that one. Ashka, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.
Listeners, you can find Stars in Their Eyes in all good bookstores and online at fremantlepress.com.au. If you enjoyed our chat today, subscribe to the Fremantle Press podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Helen Miroy, and I have been your host today. Join me next time as we continue our journey into everything books. <laughs>